I should start by saying that I'm not a doctor of anything other than chemistry and possibly nanoengineering, uh, but I have had several experiences uh, in the realm of mental health uh, and particularly anxiety uh, as it relates to graduate school and a life and career in scientific research. So this is not medical advice. If you're having serious uh, issues or issues that you may uh, that that may become serious, you should definitely seek out your campus uh, professionals and make an appointment as soon as you can. Um, however, I believe that uh, that there's a lot to be said for empathy. Um, if something I say resonates with you. Uh, this is stuff that I rarely talk about, um, then uh, maybe it will help you in your own uh, journeys. So what are some of the issues facing graduate students in the sciences and engineering that affect mental health? If you're predisposed to anxiety and depression, graduate school can really be uh, seen as a trigger after trigger after trigger. Uh, you'll never feel more dependent on your circumstances than you do as a grad student. There are asymmetric power dynamics between you and your PI. Uh, and another way of saying this is that as a graduate student, you often feel that you have zero power in the relationship. Uh, basically, you have to do what the PI says, or at least that's the perception. You certainly don't have to do what the PI says, uh, and hopefully you're in alignment on what your goals uh, are, but that's certainly the way that you feel uh, as, a, uh, as a, quote, lowly graduate student in some famous lab. The PI writes the letter, uh, so you feel like if you don't constantly impress this person that they're going to write you a, a bad letter. Uh, sometimes it is a, you know, a famous PI and maybe their opinion you feel can make or break your career. Often this is a person who, uh, for whom complaints to the, the department or the dean's level are often ignored because that person is so productive as a researcher. They bring in so many, so many grant uh, dollars that it doesn't, uh, you know, that, that your complaints uh, appear to fall on deaf ears and often do fall on deaf ears. Another issue has to do with your financial stress as a graduate student and low pay. So grad student salaries are really low. I know that when I was applying to grad schools uh, 16 years ago, the salaries were uh, pretty much the same as they are now. It's not a lot of money. I remember uh, when I proposed to my now wife in uh, grad school, I bought a ring, which wasn't even a particularly expensive ring as far as uh, engagement rings go, but I remember uh, going into, uh, into debt for that amount, and on a grad student salary, the way that I managed to feed myself was to take out uh, some amount of cash from the ATM once a week, and that was the only money that I had during that week. Uh, and and uh, there were other times <laughs> not connected with the engagement ring where I also followed that uh, prescription in order to uh, in order to survive, uh, and it, it's very stressful. The other uh, another aspect of stress. In, as a graduate student is being an outsider. So you might be a first-generation uh, college student. Uh, there's a very good chance that you are a first-generation uh, PhD student. Um, I'm first-generation college student on one side of my family, um, and no one in my orbit, uh, you know, majored in science in college and certainly didn't go on um, in, you know, in, in science to do a, a PhD in, in science or engineering. So uh, lack of, uh, of, of, of uh, you know, I don't want to, I think a role model is probably the uh, too strong a word because I certainly had role models, um, but nobody followed exactly that path in my immediate uh, orbit. Moreover, there are issues of, uh, you, you can be an outsider uh, because of your race, uh, gender identity, or ethnicity, which may not be uh, represented in your 
your graduate student cohort or in the lab that you join. Also, uh, cognitive and neurodiversity. So if you're introverted, you're shy, you're not one of these, you know, rah-rah sort of, uh, you know, jock grad students, whatever that is, but, you know, uh, hey coach, I'm gonna go uh, do this reaction. Yeah, you know, uh, I think that some some labs kind of felt like, uh, like gym class in that sense. Um, and maybe you don't, uh, maybe you're an outsider in that kind of environment. I know that I certainly would have been. Also, you can be an outsider literally for your immigration status, uh, and that can manifest in a number of ways. So if you're an international student, you face a number of barriers uh, just socially because of language barriers, and also you're trying to learn the language along with the material, along with making friends, along with establishing collaborations and making progress in your thesis, which can all be significant sources of stress. Immigration status is, uh, is an issue for uh, many individuals who, are, who arrived um, from elsewhere as a, uh, as a child of parents who are undocumented. So this is, uh, you know, people that, that, uh, that would qualify for the, uh, for the, the Dream Act, you know, were it, uh, were it enacted. And these issues are especially prominent if you're located in the United States during the current administration when, uh, the, uh, when there are various um, uh, uh, restrictions placed on immigrants from certain places and in general there's a, uh, an unwelcoming attitude from uh, the federal government um, regarding uh, regarding immigrants, uh, let's face it. So what are some other causes of uh, anxiety, depression, other mental health uh, disorders, uh, other mental health issues in grad school? So sometimes your work, I mean, it's science, you're sort of at the whim of nature. What if your project just doesn't work? Sometimes stuff doesn't work. Sometimes this creates a downward spiral where you uh, you go to your PI's office and uh, something didn't work, and then rather than uh, shift the focus of the process or, or project or change the experimental design, uh, you or the, your PI sort of double down on it, or worse, the PI perceive or the PI perceives you as not working hard enough, or maybe you perceive the PI as perceiving you as not working hard enough, and that's why it's not working well. There are an infinite number of things one might be working on in this uh, in this life, <laughs> and it, you know, if something is not moving at all for a year, uh, maybe or much less time than that, maybe it's time to do something uh, something else. And it's not your fault. It's just that some projects just <laughs> don't effing work. Another cause of anxiety, and depression, mental health issues are open-ended work hours. So the old uh, joke is that you're very flexible as a graduate student. You can work any 70 hours a week that you like or any 100 hours a week that you like. Uh, and that's kind of, uh, it's an absurd thing. I mean, in the University of California system, uh, we pay the graduate students at a rate of uh, something around 50%. You know, what does that even mean? Is that 20 hours a week? Um, well, I don't think anyone thinks it's 20 hours a week, but, you know, uh, on paper, that's certainly what the accounting uh, looks like. So the work hours are really, uh, really open-ended. There's a lot of peer pressure as a result. So the peer pressure from other people in your lab might not take the form of, you know, scowls, scoffs, and eye rolling, you know, if you leave at, uh, at, at 5 or 6 p.m., because God forbid, you might even have a kid at home that you have to take care of. Um, but maybe it is a, uh, you know, an ingrained cultural thing where 
this is you know we work 14 hours a day in this lab and uh, and those are examples of toxic cultures and if you find yourself in that situation i would advise you to get out as soon as uh, as soon as you can other forms of sort of tacit peer pressure include uh, perception that your colleagues might be publishing more than you so are you working enough hours uh, you know is this person working more hours than me or is this person publishing more than me maybe I'm not uh, maybe I'm not doing a good job on those uh, on those fronts you can also have misaligned expectations with your PI this is the source of a lot of stress uh, in a uh, graduate student's life. So some, sometimes your conception of timeline or the scope of the project and what constitutes success uh, do not align with your PIs. And this could be in either direction, right? So uh, usually I would say that the students have a more ambitious timeline than, uh, than the advisor uh, and tend to be uh, you know, harder on themselves. This is particularly true maybe for older uh, for older PIs, but if you find yourself in the reverse situation, it's time to uh, to perhaps reevaluate your, uh, you know, whether or not this uh, this is a lab environment you want to be in. There's also the uh, the issue of of insecurity and a particular form of insecurity that is known as the imposter syndrome, and the imposter the the boundary you know in my mind between insecurity and the imposter syndrome is not necessarily distinct, but the imposter syndrome sort of refers to an an overly critical attitude toward one's own abilities and the notion that in one's own mind that one doesn't belong in a particular environment and that if, because their abilities are not you know not up to snuff and they uh, eventually will be found out as being a, a fraud uh, and this is a very common thing with smart people because they have this metacognitive ability to look at their own abilities and compare their abilities to those of people around them. Uh, and one thing I, I should say is that you should never compare your insides to other people's outsides because uh, the outside uh, the, the, the outside manifestation of somebody's internal dialogue is always going to be, you know, have makeup on it and, and so on, whereas your internal uh, dialogue is 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 unvarnished and raw. Um, sometimes this metacognitive uh, ability to um, uh, to be critical of one's own uh, own abilities in relationship to others is sort of thought of as the inverse of the Dunning Kruger effect, which is uh, a, a famous uh, psychological um, theory that says that people of low competence are not in a good position to judge their level of incompetence and thus they overestimate their own competence and i would say and people have, have said this before that the imposter syndrome is kind of the you know the uh, the the inverse of that um i you know, we'll talk about solutions a little bit later, you know, potential solutions or coping strategies later in this uh, in this uh, episode. But I think that the way through the imposter syndrome is to have a frank conversation with yourself about what you're good at, what you're not good at, and focus on solving problems using the sharpest arrow arrow in your own quiver, uh, as opposed to you know, doing something that, uh, you know, that you're not good at and that you don't enjoy. And maybe some people in, you know, are better uh, at that particular thing than you. But I guarantee if you're a graduate student in the sciences and engineering, there is at least one thing in your lab, uh, in your field that you can do or uh, better than uh, than anybody else. And the way to find that uh, sometimes is by looking at intersections of competencies. Uh, and, uh, and there are at the points of intersection between fields and interests and competencies, there's definitely going to be something that you are uh, that you're the best at. I have never been diagnosed with anxiety clinically, but I have 
many clinical manifestations of anxiety disorders. Those include a months-long workup for heart palpitations, um, excessive sweating, temporomandibular joint disorders, and white coat hypertension. And the doctor wrote down white, white coat hypertension, but a lot of things in life to me look like they're wearing a white coat. So white coat hypertension is when your blood pressure is only high at the doctor's office. Uh, and uh, anyway, we'll, we'll return to that in a moment. Speaking of metacognition, sometimes I think about where I got where I am. If I have any level of professional success right now, what to what do I attribute that to? So I think I am a curious person, but I don't have the same kind of analytical ability that my classmates as an undergraduate or in graduate school or as a postdoc uh, have. Um, I basically view my own uh, abilities as kind of like an overclocked CPU. Uh, and the overclocking power, this is my own theory uh, of my own ability, um, actually sort of comes from my anxiety. And I feel like if I weren't so, uh, so nervous a lot of the time, then I wouldn't be able to to uh, to take whatever mental faculties I have and apply them uh, by burning the candle at both ends to uh, to to accomplish them. I feel like when I talk to people who are very good in uh, in computer science or mathematics, that they are just way more intelligent than I am. And by you know an IQ test or or you know the math section of the GRE or SAT. They're probably right. Um, in fact, I'm not very good at uh, at taking standardized tests. Um, in part, I like to think that because my uh, level of anxiety for such events like taking a standardized test are so high that 85% of my bandwidth is consumed by anxiety, uh, and 15% is actually you know useful for concentrated power on solving, you know, the problem. Another reason why COVID-19 has actually been good uh, for me, because I can sit in the quiet of my, uh, of my closet office. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, yeah, if things didn't, if I wasn't so anxious about things, I probably wouldn't spend so much effort to try to, to, to change them. Anxiety. There was a great book uh, by Daniel Smith a couple of years ago, maybe five-ish years ago, who talked about, he wrote a book called The, the Monkey Mind, and he described, uh, his, his main clinical manifestation was hyperhidrosis or excessive sweating. Uh, and he used to, uh, there are some anecdotes in the book about taping uh, uh, panty liners or maxi pads to his armpits to soak up the sweat and going in and, and, and how his uh, sweat went through the maxi pads and destroyed his, uh, his clothing. Um, so I can relate to that. I had uh, massive sweating problems that were on set in, uh, in high school where I would sweat through the t-shirt and then the only and and they would basically like the sweat blobs would basically meet in at my sternum the the diameter of the sweat blobs would be that uh that great um that they would meet in my chest this had nothing to do with the the temperature i even had like uh, certain types of fabric for like these billowy flannel shirts that uh, that would not show sweat on the outside. And I have to say that uh, this basically ruined my uh, social experience outside of band class where nobody cared. And also um, because when you play a brass instrument like the trombone, you sweat anyway, so uh, it, it was kind of masked in that way. Uh, the most life-changing product I ever 
found was in the fall of 2001 when I was a student, uh, when I was an undergraduate, and I found this uh, this uh, antiperspirant for excessive sweating uh, called Maxim, which uh, I've never seen in a store, uh, but you can get certain dry uh, at your local pharmacy, uh, which is an over-the-counter version of something like Drysol, but it works a lot. Uh, it, it, it works without a prescription, and Drysol kind of burns your, uh, your armpits. Uh, one of my uh, realizations from the COVID-19 pandemic is that is is just how bad my baseline level of social anxiety uh, was. So in a typical day uh, at work, there would be seminar speakers and meetings with the dean and the chair and, uh, you know, students. And I would have to probably shake hands with somebody uh three to five to six, you know, times a day. And I, if COVID-19 destroys the handshake, I will be a very happy person. Uh, not because I don't really uh, want to, um, you know, uh, get people's germs, which is, uh, which is also true, um, but also because I don't want them to have to wipe my sweaty handshake off their hand. Um, I used to wash, I used to go to the restroom so I could wash my hands uh, within five minutes of the expected time of having a, vi a visitor so that the evaporative cooling from my palm would be enough to cool my hand so much so that it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't, sweat. Uh, if somebody was a little bit late, I would have to go back to the restroom in order to wash my hands again. Uh, and th this type of, of, nobody understands it that doesn't have it, uh, but this is the type of like baseline manifestation of anxiety that, uh, that we're talking about that is particularly a bad mixture when you mix it with uh, with somebody in grad school. Uh, let's talk about cardiovascular uh, issues with anxiety. So I learned about this, uh, that I might have an issue for the first time when I went to uh, on a, a science trip to the Rochester Institute of Technology. We were went to, I think, a bioengineering lab or something uh, in high school just to, to visit and see what things were like. And they put one of the uh, ultrasound probes against my wrist and the whole uh, class could hear that my heartbeat was probably like, you know, 100 or 110 just sitting there, but sitting there and being under scrutiny of this grad student and everyone in the whole room could hear my heartbeat amplified on this, uh, on the, the, the PA and uh, was... Uh, one of my classmates turned to me and said, are you nervous? And uh, yes, it was obvious that I was. Um, so yeah, uh, my current uh, diagnosis is white coat hypertension. My doctor was about ready to prescribe me beta blockers because he was really concerned about the blood, my blood pressure every time I went to the doctor's office. Um, like, you know, one, you know, one, 150 over... 75 or 80 or something. And, uh, and I said, no, 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 I don't want drugs. Uh, let me take my blood pressure in the quiet of my, my, uh, my home. And, you know, it was like a hundred over 65 or something. And I plotted it. I measured it five times a day for two weeks and showed up at the next time with the Excel file, uh, that was plotted out. And he said, okay, I believe you, you're not getting a hypertension diagnosis, you're getting a white coat hypertension diagnosis. Now, I would ask, what difference does it make if, you know, if someone is nervous uh, in any situation where it looks like, you know, they're going to be under scrutiny? And this is actually a, a, a paradox in my life and the life of a lot of researchers that I know, where they continually put themselves in the position where they know they'll be nervous, and yet maybe sometimes it's the nerves that actually allow them to perform well. I don't know how this works, but uh, it's, you know, it's possible. Also, it doesn't help that uh, I love coffee, I love tea, uh, but 
according to 23andMe, I have a caffeine intolerance. So the most I can ever have is like, you know, oolong tea or my current thing now is to take, uh, is to, to use like a quarter teaspoon of, of instant espresso powder in my, you know, coffee like, uh, you know, uh, her herbal tea that's sort of designed to taste like coffee. <laughs> Another scare was when I went to the hospital in uh, 2007 for spilling methane sulf spraying methane sulfonic acid in my face and forearms. Uh, and I went to the, the emergency room and the nurse who took my blood pressure saw that it was like, you know, one, one, 70 over 90 or something this was like two hours af after the incident and it's because you know i was in the er i had also all you know already had like a you know two pints of fully caffeinated coffee before i gave that up um you know earlier on in the day and like okay we gotta cut the coffee down <laughs> um you know in college, before I got off coffee, I would feel like taking an exam, um, even just you know, just studying. Exams can be could be days away, uh, and I felt like I had a gun to my head. Like I literally felt like pressure on my skull uh, that uh, that was self imposed. Uh, that had to do with uh, with just you know, enormously high expectations for myself. Um, I used to have bizarre test-taking rituals. There was a, uh, you know, a beat-up flannel shirt from high school that I used to wear uh, every time I had an exam. I used to get one of the same two uh, music tracks stuck in my head so that my the monkey mind could be tamed by having this rhythm uh, that would, so that the rest of my brain could be devoted to solving, you know, the problem on the exam. Uh, and I'll tell you those two pieces of music. One was an instrumental part of the, uh, the song Blind Faith by Dream Theater. It's very syncopated. The other was the uh, tank battle scene from in the soundtrack to Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. The thing that they have in common is, uh, is this sort of uh, rhythmic syncopation. It's a good thing for a monkey mind to chew on. Uh, it's repetitive, but it's also kind of interesting. Uh, and anyway, the rest of my brain could focus on the task at hand. So anyway, I had these sort of bizarre, like test-taking rituals in my, my weird flannel shirt and my syncopated music. I've always had problems with concentration on uh, on standardized tests, and I think that while there is, we are right as a community to question the value of the GRE uh, for issues of uh, of of access to the types of information and training that some communities, uh, disadvantaged communities. Uh, have or do not have in order to do well on standardized tests. It is also true that people with uh, anxiety and neurodiverse uh, individuals uh, do not also also do not do well on these tests uh, because it's testing one very specific thing, and it assumes that you can use all of your brain power on the exam without being consumed by. Uh, by anxiety. And maybe there are other circumstances outside of a test-taking center uh, where those people would indeed flourish. Uh, and that is another reason to be skeptical of standardized tests. <laughs> another manifestation is uh, temporomandibular joint disorder. Uh, this is a, a TMJ, um, and it arises uh, from clenching one's teeth at night, uh, or if you're like me, uh, contorting your face while, while in undergrad you played uh, uh, Unreal Tournament. <laughs> um, so both of these things sort of cause me to uh, have this serious problem in my, uh, in my TM joints, and that's why uh, I've never gotten my wisdom teeth out because I'm scared to death of uh, reigniting those uh, those pains, which I saw a specialist for uh, 12 years ago, uh, perhaps longer than that, um, no, 16 years ago, and uh, have worn a dental appliance at night uh, ever since. 
an especially scary episode with uh, with anxiety due to uh, due to academic performance came in the way of heart palpitations. So in the summer and fall of 2008, I noticed that I was getting a lot of uh, skipped heartbeats. So this is, you feel like uh, like your heart has skipped a beat and then the next beat is especially strong. That's called a, a technically called a premature ventricular contraction or a PVC whereby one of the uh, cells in your myocardium um, initiates a contraction, which is an uncoordinated contraction, and the heart doesn't beat as normal. Normally, the, the sinus uh, in the heart is what causes a coordinated contraction, but when that doesn't happen, you get a premature ventricular contraction, and when the sinus rhythm takes over, all the blood that is pooled in the, the left ventricle, from my understanding, is what you feel as a uh, as that hard, heavy heartbeat. Some of you may have felt this when you know you got a, a, a you know a scary piece of news by email or the phone or something, or you saw something on TV, uh, or maybe you were at a sporting event or something and you felt your heart skip a beat. That's what it is. There was. Uh, I was getting a lot of them and it was like, you know, I was noticing them. A lot of people don't notice them. They happen 12 times a day. No one notices. I was having like 50 or a hundred per day. And those are the ones that I noticed. Uh, there were, there was also uh, a, there was a morning in November of 2008. I think it was probably right before the election in 2008 uh, that I was also nervous about. Um, and I woke up in the morning and I was having, I probably had a hundred PVCs before I even put my feet on the floor. And I, and it was, I, I was just so concerned that my, uh, that my blood wasn't getting out of my heart that, uh, that to nourish the rest of my cells, uh, that I, uh, my wife walked me to urgent care. Um, and I had a, uh, you know, over the course of that week, I had to get, you know, the week off from graduate school. Uh, my advisor, you know, uh, to his credit was very understanding, um, even though pretty much all of this came out of being nervous about, you know, work and expectations and working too many hours and working seven days a week and, and so on. So I had a stress test, an echocardiogram. I had a 24 hour Holter monitor, which is a continuous thing. You attach the electrodes to your, uh, you know, your, your body, and then uh, you, you give it back to them. They go over the results. And um, during that period where I was wearing the Holter monitor, I had at least one episode of ventricular tachycardia, and when and that is when the uh, the heart beats uh, at uh, an extremely rapid uh, pace, like you know 180 BPM, um, and uh, and it doesn't look like a normal you know rhythm at all by the uh, by the e ECG. And when my primary care doctor said, you know, we found a ventricular tachycardia on your, your Holter monitor. And I said, I know. And he said, how did, how did you know? I said, I know because I felt it. You know, apparently he's used to dealing with people who are not that in tune with your body, but that's one of the things that comes with, uh, with, I think this sort of metacognition is also a meta awareness of how you are feeling. Uh, this was also especially troubling because this happened uh, to me a couple weeks before a, uh, a, an NSF trip for students to go to India for 16 days as part of a, an exchange visit. And for part of that trip, we were going to be in a rural uh, village, which was very far from any kind of uh, medical care. Uh, so, uh, and also, um, on uh, 11 28 of 2008 there was a uh, a terrorist shooting at uh, at a hotel in Mumbai uh, which uh, put you know the nation rightfully uh, of India on high alert and this is also a time when you know um, fears of terrorist attacks at uh, airports and cultural sites had was gone way up it was go had gone way up and where were we going to airports and cultural sites 
So um, I ended up seeing an electrophysiologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital. We did even more workup. I had a cardiac MRI, which is probably the coolest like picture of me that's ever been uh, taken where I'm like sliced down the middle longitudinally uh, like a fatality move in Mortal Kombat uh, and to see like all the organs and stuff. And then they, they told me that my heart was actually in good condition. Uh, they did not see any evidence of scarring. They were concerned about like psoriasis and dry cuticles and stuff, which is evidence of, of autoimmune diseases, which can be, uh, which can be associated with, uh, with cardiac arrhythmia. Um, they put me on a, a four week Holter monitor, um, which kind of had like a cell phone device clipped to my, my belt that I had to wear around for, for like a month. Um, and they didn't find anything that was particularly troubling in that. Uh, I had, you know, gone completely off of coffee. I'd sort of stopped drinking alcohol. Um, I increased my potassium intake by eating a lot of celery and potatoes and orange juice. Uh, and, uh, and I started taking an omega, uh, three fatty acid supplement, like a fish oil supplement. Cause that was one of my PhD advisors. Um, so he has a congenital, he had a congenital heart, has a congenital heart, uh, uh, thing and he was giving me uh, this kind of you know you know, dietary advice so I did a bunch of things I don't know what worked something worked and I get way fewer uh, and most of those things I still do now so most of the uh, the those issues have, have gone probably but when I there are times when I don't sleep too well for a while which is particularly uh, problematic being the uh, the parent of an infant and now toddler um, so sometimes they they come back and uh, ultimately, the electrophysiologist told me to uh, to uh, get more sleep and to try to manage my stress better than uh, better than I was. Interestingly, my primary care doctor also called me on my cell phone, and this is my my family primary care doctor from my hometown, and he told me to smell the roses because things were pretty good. And if you looked on paper, things were pretty good, but you know, I was still a grad student, right? Which brings me to how does, so those are some of the strategies that like I use to cope with particular uh, health, mental health issues in grad school, but uh, what are some general strategies? A lot of it comes down to your decisions, like the big decisions before grad school or as you're entering grad school or sometime during grad school when you realize that maybe you need to change your circumstances. A lot of the uh, a lot of mental health issues come with not necessarily, you know, uh, not having a PI who creates a toxic environment, but maybe someone who doesn't create any kind of environment and maybe is not uh, you know, maybe they're not, uh, you know, if, if they're not antagonistic toward you, then maybe they're just not understanding or they don't try to create a, a culture of, of, uh, of inclusion and, and, uh, and tolerance of, of time off and, and, and so forth. So in a way, the personnel in the group, your colleagues, the students and postdocs who are in the group are more important than the PI who, of course, can seed the lab culture, but usually isn't the one who primarily sustains it. Um, it's often the, the people themselves, uh, the, the students and postdocs themselves who sustain the culture of the lab. So make sure that they are uh, they are healthy, they are caring, uh, even loving, uh, that, uh, that this is a kind of lab that is known for its support of its students, not just from the PI, but from the other individuals in the group. Please, please, please keep in mind that your PhD thesis is not necessarily likely to save the world in and of itself. It is much more important that you use that time to develop as a scientist, to become a, 
you know, a, a black belt martial artist in the skills of creating knowledge. That's what a PhD is. And the project is more like the substrate. That's not, you know, you develop some expertise in that, but it's sort of incidental to the expertise that you're supposed to develop in the skills of creating knowledge and doing original research. So keep that in mind. If, if it's not exactly the project you thought you would be doing when you signed up for grad school, um, but you love the people, the people, uh, the people really like each other, they're motivated to work toward a common purpose, then that and, and the PI is aligned with, uh, with your interests and the, the flourishing of individual group members to the maximum extent possible, that is actually much more important than the actual scientific project. So what about after grad school? So I was somebody who, uh, you know, when many of these, these issues with these treatments for these, uh, these issues born out of anxiety and, uh, and, uh, and less depression, but sometimes depression, but mostly anxiety, uh, were, were occurring were like, my life is only going to get more complicated and more stressful in my professional career, whatever that ended up being. Uh, how is it that I could possibly manage if I can't even manage, you know, being a, or can barely manage being a grad student? Well, after grad school, after postdoc, your life circumstances will change a lot. Uh, you will have a much more control in your life to uh, to avoid triggers, um, to uh, put yourself in circumstances where you have uh, control over how you're going to react. You'll have more control over your schedule, so when to exercise, so exercising, um, you know, I try to exercise every day. Uh, there's always a period of sort of euphoria uh, after that where uh, I don't, you know, get anxious about anything for a certain amount of time. Um, and uh, I think sleep is really important. So uh, carving out a time when even if you can't be sleeping for some set number of hours, so, you know, seven or eight hours per day, at least at least be in bed and set your alarm for not earlier than some set amount of time. So at least there's some consistency in your, uh, in your sleep schedule. That's something that's been really useful for me. Another really important factor is age. I think early on, you know, I, you know, I wanted to make the Star Trek universe a, uh, you know, a reality and I still do, but, uh, I realize the uh, you know the scope of my uh, my constraints and what it's what I'm likely to be able to accomplish or to help other people in being able to accomplish, and that sense of uh, of equanimity about my own scope as a researcher has been enormously helpful in reducing my uh, stress uh, and anxiety. But it's not um, it's something that comes with age and experience. It's not something that I could have done when I was uh, 25. Another uh, tool is meditation. There was a time probably for about three years between really 2015 and, and, and uh, throughout 2017 where I was meditating, uh, so uh, using apps or not um, for about uh, 10 minutes per day, every single day, uh, first thing in the morning. And I found that the, that was uh, helpful to me, um, have a better relationship with my thoughts. Um, I felt like I was better able to appreciate, um, you know, small uh, pleasures in life and take more advantage of, of, uh, of, kindness and generosity in, in individuals that I meet and things like the flavors of food and, and so on in my, my everyday experience. Uh, since having a kid, uh, I have pretty much 
not entirely drop the habit because I will still do some kind of mindfulness-ish practice for like a few seconds or a minute <laughs> every day. Um, but I would say that there are some lasting benefits from training myself to have a different relationship to my thoughts. Um, and that's been, uh, that's been useful. Um, I would recommend uh, Dan Harris's uh, podcast and app. Um, he's a, uh, um, that's the ABC News guy. Um, he's uh, fantastic and has fantastic teachers um, on, his, uh, on his program. I always thought that, so getting back to, won't my stressors always be worse than they are now? I mean, I'm just a grad student. I'm not, I'm not but if, if you're watching this and you're a grad student, you are. Uh, won't things just always get worse? You know, I'm a PI now. I have to write grants. I have uh, people in the lab. I need to pay their salaries using grants. I need to get papers accepted. Sometimes I don't like what the reviewers say. Uh, sometimes I don't like what the grant reviewers say. Usually I don't like it, even if I need to hear it. Um, so how, how do I manage like being a, oh yeah, and public speaking, like for somebody with social anxiety like me, how do I manage like speaking in front of a, of a crowd, uh, you know, multiple times per week? How am I even doing this video and, you know, podcast and I'm going to put it out there? I didn't really think in the depths, depths of my, uh, you know, anxiety, episodes of anxiety that I could do it. Uh, but it turns out that the amount of control and uh, the amount of control and power over my own circumstances that I have now, um, to a large extent, has overwhelmed the, uh, the stressors of having no control over my circumstances as a younger person. And I would also repeat uh, what I said about something about uh, age and equanimity, about your own, uh, your own scope and, uh, and understanding what are the strongest, what are the sharpest quivers in your arrow, what are the sharpest arrows in your quiver, what are the skills that you are going to push on in order to make a difference and not worry about the other stuff. Um, that has been really helpful. You always kind of habituate to the new workload, um, and there's a misconception that if I can't handle my thesis project, how can I handle, you know, five people's thesis projects or working at a company and having all of these other responsibilities? Well, a lot of things disappear. The financial pressure, you know, once you get a job that's commensurate, where the salary is commensurate with a PhD salary, um, financial stress doesn't disappear, but it goes away a lot. A lot of it is attenuated by having like a real job, honestly. Um, and you, you will habituate, you'll have more uh, control over your own schedule and those will all be for the better. You're also, as you get older, less likely to want to impress people at all times. And uh, I think this is probably probably why, as you get uh, you know really old, you're okay with the uh, with the beige Lincoln Town Car um, because uh, that's just the most comfortable you know ride, and that that's what you want. Um, so I think that there are some natural sort of smoothening of the rough edges of one's uh, one's anxiety and and tendency toward uh, depression that occur. Uh, by the time one is in one's mid to late uh, 30s. And, but it's not too early to think about how, how those, um, uh, some of the changes that have occurred in your uh, you know, older colleagues or mentors might be applicable now. And I think I've, uh, you know, said all I, all I need to about, about those. So with that said, uh, I hope that at least one thing in this video or episode has been helpful to you, and I will see you next time.